Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll, we'll get started. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness. Thank you that you are faithful, that you are faithful in, in our lives, that you're faithful. You, you are worthy of faith. You are full. We can invest our full faith in you, that you do not disappoint us. So we honor you tonight. We thank you so much for your word. And we thank you so much for the season of life that we're in, for the work that you are doing in this region and around the world. And we give you all honor and glory in Jesus' name. Everyone say it. Amen. 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 I'm going to just go ahead and say right out the gate, I apologize for how shiny my head is. Um, (laughs) So don't stare directly at it. Uh, (laughs) I just got off a plane um, a few hours ago, and I wanted to have a clean shave for y'all. So I went home and shaved it up. And... uh, but once it's fresh, it's shiny. So don't, <laughs> don't, don't uh, direct your attention right at it. Don't hold up any papers because if it catches one of those beams, it's going to be like the magnifying glass and ants. It's going to set that joint right on fire. So you don't want to do that. And we had a, a guy who was in charge of the baby powder ministry. He was supposed to hook me up, but he called in. So... so <laughs> I'm playing. <laughs> I'm playing. We don't have that. <laughs> but I am accepting applications. So if you are handy with the uh, baby powder, I'm just playing. Some people are not laughing. They're just staring at me like, come on, man. <laughs> Johnson and Johnson, I got stock. Okay. Um, I'm super excited about about tonight. It, it is never a, uh, a small thing to be able to come here and to be able to speak these words, right? Because speaking these words are not, it's not like speaking my words. These, are, these words have like a lot of weight. So it's never a small thing. Um, so it should never be a small thing when you hear his words. It should never be a small thing. It should never be like, ah, well, it's Wednesday. We'll see. Like come in expecting Right? Come on. So I'm excited about this because this is one that he worked me with as I'm writing this thing. And, and, and it always starts with this idea. Like he'll just kind of give me a flash and then I'll start studying and reading and I'll start learning things. And I'm like, whew, man, should I even say this? But, but he's so gracious because as I say this, I'm saying it not just to you but to myself. So we all get to grow. Amen. Amen. So, so the theme of this month at OCC is um, a new season. A new season begins. And um, new season is like a Christianese thing for like a new thing that God is doing. Right? Because, because anytime we say the word seasons, like if you're not like in church, that might be confusing. Like what do you mean a new season begins? And we, and we always associate seasons with time. So is there going to be another season in, in two and a half months? Well, it depends on how well you move in this season because this joint could be long. This could be a long season or it could be a short season. It just depends on me because he's in and out of time. So to him, he's like, well, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting. So, so a new season begins, I think, is something that, that myself, uh, especially, I got to settle my heart in the reality of a new season. Because it just sometimes old seasons are so old. Like, and I mean things that you've gone through over. And I, that, that you, it's like perpetual. It's like, you, it's like the same thing over and over. And you're like, man, when is this going to end? And things just, they just sometimes just drag on. But he is so good because I believe that this is a new season, especially in the body. I got a lot of friends who are pastors at churches around, and, they, and I'll be talking to them, and they're like, man, it's, it's just been heavy lately. I'm like, why? What's going on? Man, I just had this guy transition out and that woman transition, and there's just so much transition. And I'm like, man, he's just positioning. That's all he's doing. He's like a che- he is like the greatest chess player that the universe will ever know. Like he's putting things in place that you didn't even see coming. And just because they transition out don't, doesn't mean they transition out. He's just positioning. 
That's all he's doing. Right, a setup. Come on. It's a setup. So he's just moving things. So we have to stay connected to the reality that is God is still on the throne. He is still in charge. And nothing escapes his, his knowing. It's not like something popped up, like, like something goes wrong in your life, and you're like, and he's like, oh, shoot. I ain't see that coming. I did not see that coming. That's how I am. <laughs> I react like that. And thank God he's not like that. Because <laughs> it would be crazy, right? It would be crazy, right? Because sometimes some seasons you have to just endure. You just got to endure. And he has never ever promised that every season is going to be good. Winter is good in its own right, but so is summer. And sometimes summer sucks. When it's like 150 degrees for like six weeks, you're like, man, when is this going to end? But he is, uh, he is so faithful. So the message that he has um, given me tonight is, is, is I, I'm not really married to the title. I'm just going to say it, new faith for a new season. Um, but, but the faith isn't new. It's deeper. It's a deeper faith. For a new season. It says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, it it explains, I'm going to look at verse 1 and verse 6, and then we're going to move into the story that we're going to kind of be going through today. And it says this in verse 1, now faith is confidence, and this is the New International Version, in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Assurance about what you don't see. Sometimes it's like, man, I just want to see. Show me now so that I can be assured in this next thing. But that's not faith. That's not faith. See, what it says in verse 6, it says this. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. There's not very many things in the Bible that I ever read God saying something's impossible. There's not a lot of things that I've read in Scripture where it says this is impossible because it says all things are. So it talks a lot about what's possible. But this scripture is very clear as to what is impossible. And what's impossible about this kind of alarms me. Because it says, now without faith, it's impossible to please him. That means that there are certain things in life God takes pleasure in. There's certain things that we do that he takes pleasure in. But we have to understand that no matter what we do, if it's not connected to faith, it doesn't please him. Like like if you you think about the story in Acts where where, um, where, uh, Peter goes to Cornelius' house. And it says that his gifts and his offering, like all that he does for the poor and all that he does to help the people have come up to me as a memorial offering. But it didn't justify him yet, right? It's because of all of the stuff that he was doing with the motive that he was doing it with that God took Peter and connected faith to what he was doing. Because faith gives you a seat. Faith gives you a seat. Because there's a lot of people in this world doing a lot of good things. But we are out to please God. So I can do and do and do and do, and it pleases everybody around me. But if my faith is not connected to what I'm doing, then it's not pleasing the one that I'm supposed to be working for. It's pleasing everybody else around me. So this is what he's saying. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And then, it, and then, he, and then he begins to unlock kind of like the basis of what that is. And I love this. 
It says, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. First thing. You'll talk to people and they'll say, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in him. I believe he created everything. I believe in everything. I believe, I believe that there is a God. But there's a big difference between believing in and believing on. Because he said it's twofold. Those who believe he exists and knows that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So there is a very personal connection to this God that we know. And this is what's crazy about seeking him. If you don't know him, how do you know what to look for? So if, if you're not like, if you're not seeking, if you don't know what to look for, how are you going to know when it shows up? How are you going to say, there he is, ah, there he is. There he is. There was a whole bunch of people who didn't believe that Jesus was the son of God. You know why? Because they didn't know who was in their midst. So we, gotta, we have to know what to look for so that we can seek him earnestly. I am earnestly, honestly, to the depth of my soul looking for him. So I have to, I have to know his ways so I can know when he's come through here. So if love is not attached, it can't be him. If honor is not attached, it can't be him. If faithfulness, so we got to know what to look for. Because when we come to him, we got to believe, one, that he's there. And two, that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly are looking for him. Because there's a lot of people wanting a reward that ain't really looking for him. I'm not saying here. I'm just saying in, in the earth. And the beautiful thing about that is this. That desire to do good, God has placed in humanity. That's why you got a lot of people who don't love God are doing everything they can to help people. We have to connect them to him so that he can take what they do and multiply it, not just in the earth, but in the heavens. So it draws value in the heavens. Same thing will happen with Cornelius. So Peter walks into that environment and connects them. Now, Cornelius is one who understood God, but Peter connected him to God. Because it said while he was preaching the gospel and saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell in that place. Because something shifted in their heart. They connected. And that's going to be kind of what we're talking about today. Faith. Faith, man. Because this new season is going to take faith. It's going to take us knowing who he is. Knowing what he looks like so we can move this, so we can be connected to this thing the right way. And this is why I'm saying that. Um, it, it's easy when, and you'll hear in a lot of circles, you hear this conversation. We don't do church the way they do church. And, if, and, if, and I'm, not, I'm not knocking anybody. I'm saying this. Like if in my own head, I can get so used to doing church because I'm American. And American culture is do. But what he's calling us to do is be. Is to be. If I get so wrapped up in doing and I forget about being, then what I'm doing is not pleasing him. So that's where we have to be. In this season, it's going to demand more. This is what it is. It demands more. When the church, when the early church shifted in the book of Acts, it demanded more. It's the same thing with us. It's going to demand more. So we're going to look. I love this, this passage in Hebrews. In this whole chapter of 11 where it begins talking about the champions of faith. And it all revolves around the first verse. 
It says, now faith is a confidence in what we hope for, an assurance in what we don't see. And then it begins to talk about all of the unknown that all these champions of faith, faith were faced with, but they still moved. But they still moved. So today I'm going to talk about this guy named Moses. In Exodus chapter 14. And we're going to start in verse 10 and move through 22. Now, if you, if you know the story of Moses, you kind of understand how this thing is going. If you don't know, this is kind of what's going on. Moses is in the place now where God is using him to set the Israelites free. They've been slaves for hundreds of years under the oppression of Egypt. So, so slavery was all they knew. Generation after generation after generation after generation, slavery is all they knew. All they knew was oppression. All they knew was serving these people, serving this other master who worshipped numerous other gods. That's all they knew. That was the culture not just around them but in them. So they're in this place where this is the environment. And then Moses shows up and begins to break the hold of the Egyptians on the Israelites. And it finally comes to the place where Pharaoh says, okay, man, get out of here. After all these plagues, after livestock is dead, after crops are killed, after infestations, and after children are dead, Pharaoh finally says, okay, okay, go. So when they leave, Egypt says, this is what, this is what Pharaoh's advisors say, Israel is gone and so is our workforce. It's like when my, like my no, I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm not going to say that. Have you ever uh, <laughs> not known how to do something and then the person who knows how to do it leaves and then you got to try to figure this thing out? It's kind of like that. <laughs> so all of Israel leaves and these guys are like, I don't know how to wash these dishes. I don't know how to make these bricks. I don't know how to build this city. So now we have to, have to tarnish our manicured hands, and we actually have to get calluses on these baby hands, and I actually got to do some work? Nah, man, nah, we're going to get these guys. They got me. <laughs> he got me with the okie doke, but I'm going to go get these guys back. A little more extreme than that, but you understand what I'm saying. So all of Egypt begins to pursue the Israelites. And at verse 10 is where the the children of Israel turn around and, and they see what's going on. And it says, as Pharaoh approached, I'm using my phone. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. It said they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses... Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Yeah, this is crazy. What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? So what these guys are so um, um, caught up in is the reality that this army is now chasing them and pursuing them. So they think Moses had ill intent for bringing them out in the desert. Not freedom, death. So you didn't bring us out here for freedom. You brought us out here to die. That's what's going on right now. Sometimes in life we are so attached to our past that it makes it very, very difficult to move into the promise that God has for us. And and you don't realize how attached to your past you actually are until pressure comes. Until, Until the fear of what's facing you drives you back to comfort because that's really what these guys are talking about, what they know. See, I know what to expect in Egypt, but I don't know what to expect with you bringing me way out here because my expectation has now changed from freedom to death. Why? Pressure. Pressure. So they start pressing Moses. Why you bring me out here? Is it because there's no graves in Egypt? Is that why you brought me out here? 
Then he said this in verse 12. Didn't we say to you in Egypt to leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. This is what these guys are saying. They began to tell Moses uh, how they felt because they didn't see what he saw. I'm going to say it again because we have to really understand the reality of leadership. They didn't understand what Moses saw. They didn't have the same perspective as Moses. So they couldn't see what Moses saw. So instead of Moses casting them down, this is what he does. This is why we have to understand as leads, right? Because I'm, I'm only saying part of that to say this. We are leads of this new season. And some of us in this room are further along in leadership than others, but we are all leading in this new season. So the past cannot be, the way that we've always done things cannot be what we're holding on to in this new thing. If the, if the thing that you've always held on to is Jesus, then praise God, keep holding. But what I'm saying is I can't do tomorrow the same thing the same way as I did yesterday. There's some things I got to shift. So what Moses does in verse 13, it says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Come on now. Your same oppressors, the same that has been oppressing you for generations, you're not going to see them again after today. Because God is going to do something new. He's going to do something that's never been done. So then we have a decision to make. Which word will I hold on to? Will I hold on to that word or will I hold on to the same word I just said? I'm only saying that as from the standpoint of one of these Israelites. Because I'm hearing new information. And I have a decision to make with this new information. I can allow old information to cancel out new information because of what I'm comfortable with, because of what I'm used to, because of what looks familiar to me, or I can hold on to this new information and wait to see what God is going to do. So who am I going to connect myself to? Am I going to operate in this faith that is going to bring pleasure to God because it's, it's not necessarily my faith that he takes pleasure in, but it's my faith in knowing what he's able to do and believing what he's able to do. That brings him pleasure because then he can say, you know what, just sit back. Watch. Watch what I, and I'm not talking about laziness. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I don't mean sitting on the couch, not doing nothing, wait for the check to just show up in the mail. I'm saying we join him, not ask him to join us. And I think a lot of times I get, I get myself in that position. Well, I'm asking him to connect himself to what I'm trying to do. And he's like, why would you do that? Because what I have to do is so much greater than what you think you have to do. All you have to do is just connect. That's, what, that's the option that Moses has given these guys. And the first thing that he addresses is the first thing that God always addresses, fear. Don't be afraid of what you see. Because what you see, man, shifts, changes, depends on the wind. So he's like, man, don't, don't just look out and focus on what you see. Get my perspective. That's what Moses is inviting him into. And I love what God says. We're going to talk about verse 14. It says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Because sometimes, man, we can get in our own way. And, and we don't know that we're in our own way because we're just responding to what we see in front of us. Or I should say this, we're reacting 
to what we see in front of us. We have to get better at responding to what we see in front of us. So sometimes, man, I'll get my own way. I'll just start doing stuff. Like, okay, we got to do this. Then that happened. We got to do this. Got to move this. Got to call this guy. Got to put this guy in place. Got to start moving and start doing it. He's like, dude, just, just slow down. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. All you have to do is be still in his presence. And you just watch. And I love, man, what, what God says to Moses after this. He says, and the Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? <laughs> Tell the Israelites to move on. Because God doesn't see opposition the same way we see opposition. That's the vision I need. I need his perspective of opposition. What does this look like to you? Because you know what this looks like to me. What does this look like to you, God? And he tells Moses, like, Moses, dude, tell these guys to move on. Let's go. We, I, I didn't bring you out of Egypt to die here. I told you a land flowing with milk and honey. Do you see milk and honey anywhere out here? No. You see a bunch of scared Israelites standing around. And sometimes you'll look in yourself and that's what you'll see. Do you see the fruition of the promise that I've given you? Then don't stop there. If that's not where the promise is, then I don't know why you stand in this place. So he says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on, man. Move on from yesterday. Move on from the past. That's over. A new season means a new season. Up in youth, uh, what we have going on right now is we have a five on five. So we have various services for young people. I see a young guy in here. Brother, how old are you about? Ninth grade? Yep, you. Green shirt. Handsome young man. Fifteen? Seventh grade. Did you say seventh grade? You look tall, man. <laughs> so what we have upstairs is... Uh, is we have high school and junior high together up there, and we have a five-on-five. Five. So we have, I've asked five of our leaders to share for five minutes about how God has transitioned them from a new season, from one season to a new season. So what verse are, were you standing on when you moved into the new season? What was the promise that God had for you as you moved into the new season? Because there's something, like, we just got to get ourselves in position where we start standing on some things. Not standing on the past or the things of the past. It could be a promise, but you got to understand the promise is only as good as the source of the promise. So it's got to be his promise that we stand on. So I, want, I wanted the leaders to, to tell the students about that so that they can illustrate the reality of this moving on. Tell the Israelites to move on from here. Like, don't stay in the past. Don't stay just handcuffed by fear, paralyzed by fear, paralyzed from lack of perspective. But get connected to what God has going on in the future and move on from this place. So then he tells Moses how to do that. And that's when it starts to get real. He says to him, raise, I mean, it's been real, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry land. Who the heck would think of that? He's like, why are you crying out to me? Just part the water. <laughs> I, would, I don't know about you. Maybe you're holier than me, but I wouldn't think about parting the water. I'd have been crying out too. Like, what? I don't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> he's like, just part the water. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Verse 17, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they'll go in after. Why? Because the ones you see today, you ain't going to see tomorrow. He says, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and his army. Through his chariots and his horses. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. It's all part of the plan. 
Why? His glory. His glory. Because sometimes, man, when you just worship, you, like the, Israel, the, the, the Egyptians were worshiping so many things for so long that it became normal to the Israelites. So what he's saying is, I'm about to squash all this, and I will gain glory through your oppressors. Watch. So he just says, watch. So God begins to demonstrate part of his eternal character, and that's faithfulness. Your faith will put his faithfulness on display. My faith, my faith will put his faithfulness on display. And that's what he's doing. These guys are going to know. Sorry for these guys because they're going to learn and then die. But but they're all going to know. And this is what's, what's so crazy. Watch verse 19. It says, And the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. You see all this activity that starts happening? Withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of the cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. So he's positioning himself between them and their oppressors. So he's putting his resource who he is, his power, his authority between the Israelites and what is trying to come and end and, 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 and uh, put out the reality of this promise that God has for them. So he takes his, his power, his authority, his might, and he puts it between them and the oppressors. Man, you better ask somebody. This is some crazy stuff right here. Verse 20 says, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, and this is where it starts getting wild. Throughout the night, the the cloud brought darkness to one side. I wonder which side got the darkness. Mm -hmm. And light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night. This is why. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night... The Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it to dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. Watch. With a wall of water on their right and on their left. See, how many of y'all seen the Prince of Egypt in this room? It's a classic. If you ain't seen it, you need to watch it. It's a good one. It's a good one. Moses takes that staff and he puts that joint back like this, like I used to get whooped, like way back here. Like my mom used to reach back. I don't know what she was reaching towards. I think there was like a measure of power that was coming. So she would come, wabba. And then all of a sudden you have perspective. (laughs) Oh, okay. I get it. (laughs) But in the movie, The Prince of Egypt, Moses takes that staff way back here and he's like, Wow, and the water's like, Psh. it wasn't like that. You had to wait in the midst of God doing something. And sometimes we're in a place where we're like, is it going to happen yet? Is it time to go yet? Ground ain't dry. I said dry ground. That ground's not dry. So you wait. And it says all night. What we do every New Year's Eve in youth is we have a, uh, an, an all-nighter. Every New Year's Eve, all-nighter, because we want to get the kids in a safe place, right, where we can just go in, have fun. Like, I'm talking Martinelli's. It's going down. Like, it's fun. <laughs> and that is an all-nighter. All-nighters are painful. Painful. This was an all-nighter. It says, all that night, light on one side, Darkness on the other. Nobody was asleep. No one was asleep in the Israelites' camp because it was light on that side. So you standing there waiting, waiting, waiting. Come on, Lord, do it. Come on, he's doing it. Look, look, this is crazy. This is crazy. I was looking up the part where they believe the Israelites crossed over. And the depth of that part of the Red Sea ranged from 15 meters to 206 meters. You know what that means? That means it wasn't a straight walk. And this is what's so amazing about faith. They're walking down into darkness. 
with walls of water on both sides. Do you know how long that walk was? So it's not like walking like this. They're in hills. They're on hills and in valleys. Every step requiring more faith than the step before. Waiting for this walk to be over. As they climb down these mountains and climb up these mountains, their faith had to grow stronger and stronger and stronger with every step. Do you know why? Because there was a new season on the other side. So they had to hike to get there. What am I saying? It's not always going to be easy. And sometimes when you're in the lowest place, you forget that you're in the midst of the miracle because that's where they were. They're in the midst of a miracle, and sometimes when it gets so low, you don't realize that. you like, where are you? I'm in the same place I was when I, when I parted this thing, dude. Don't ever trip. Don't forget. You are still in the midst of a miracle. It's just hard to see because you're in a valley because you're in this low place. But he says, don't lose faith, man. Just look. There's still walls of water, which means my hand is still on this moment. Just like my hand is going to be on tomorrow's moment. Just like as you walk into this next season, our faith has to grow stronger because we need the new faith for a new season. I can't be the same yesterday as I'm going to be tomorrow. So I have to pursue whatever that faith unpacks in my life. And that's the same thing for all of us in this room. Come on, in order for us to grab a hold of this new season, we got to get our faith up. Faith is not a noun in Scripture. It's a verb. Faith is not just this thing, but it's action. It's action. It goes deeper than just a Christianese word that we can use and throw around. It's like a life thing. So these guys had a decision to make. I can stay here on this side with my oppressors coming, or I can start walking deeper. I can go to a deeper place with the Lord. Because on the, end of, on the other side of this deeper place, my whole life and everybody connected to me is going to be elevated. So I won't always be in the valley. I'm going to come to the place where we're at the top of this thing. Where 200 meters disappears. And it becomes dry land. So that's what we have to do. That's what we need to do. As we approach this next season, as I was preparing this, the Lord is asking me, like, where is your faith? Where is it? How much faith? Not like the, oh, I believe God, for, but like the real, like, where is that at? It's like a meter where we got to measure it. And, and you got to be careful when you're in full-time ministry. You got to stay connected because you can get so into doing that like doing just becomes if you're not careful so we have to recognize the snares of the enemy and 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 the only reason I bring up full-time ministry is because that's what I know I mean I wasn't always in full-time ministry but that's my current so what we have to do is we have to keep ourselves in a place where we are, no matter how deep in a valley we get, we got to know we are in the midst of a miracle. Because there is a new season. And it is always miraculous when he's working. This, this story is, is such an amazing story that they echo it again in Hebrews chapter 11, kind of where we started. Verses 24 through 29 says this, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
Verse 25 says, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Watch what it says here. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. I'm just reading y'all the Bible. As of greater value than the treasure of Egypt because that new season. He was looking ahead to his reward. Not stuff. For the sake of of Christ, not for the sake of stuff, not for the sake of being written about in Hebrews chapter 11. But he had this, this other perspective. It wasn't to grow the biggest church. It wasn't to have, and you have to understand, everything I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not putting on this house. This is my house. Not mine. It's Pastor G's. But you understand what I'm saying. Like, this home. It's our house. This home. I'm saying, I'm saying like the song we sang, I didn't come here for blessings. I'm not here just to like give me all the stuff. I came here for Jesus. And that's, that's, what, that's, that's what Moses, that's, this Bible is talking about Moses looking ahead to that. And Jesus even said that. It says here, it says verse 27, by faith he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. What does that mean? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The assurance of what we do not see. Moses saw that. Verse 26, it says this, By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Verse 29, By faith... People passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. So, so God is so done with the past. And, and I don't, you know what I mean. I, I, don't, I don't mean like, like the... the um, like we're reading about the ancients of it, like the men and women of faith. I'm talking about like whatever is holding us, he's done with that. So we have to decide, are we done with that? Am I done with the past? Or am I going to say, man, I, I remember what that used to be like when I served that master. I know what to expect with that master, but this one, I don't know what to expect. But he says, bro, you know what I got for you? And not for you, through you. It's for all of us. What does he want to do through our lives, through Victoria's life? Who is an amazing young woman. Through Herman's life. I mean, through Pastor Lynn and Lucy. Like, what does he want to do through our lives? What if we were willing to cross through the Red Sea? What if we were willing to be surrounded by these walls that represent faith? That represents God's faithfulness. That's a hard step. But I think, I think, if, I think once one person kind of takes that step, I think it makes it a little easier for other people. Because who was the first one? to start walking through there. Was it Moses? I don't know. I would like to think it was. But if it was, who was the second? And then the third? And then the fourth? And then once the line started moving, I think it just started to create momentum. And then if you stayed, people are looking at you sideways. Instead of if you went, they're looking at you sideways. Like, what do you think you're doing right now? Do you see this? <laughs> but once everyone started moving, right, everyone started connecting to God's faithfulness. Everyone started connecting to the reality. They started remembering this land of milk and honey. They started remembering this next season. Not this season. They actually started to forget this season for a moment. And what if we just trusted him and just started moving? What if we just, just what if? What if we did that? I think that this is time because a new season's beginning. 
And God is going to um, reveal his faithfulness to us in greater measure than we've seen before. So I'm just saying, like, if I'm in. I'm in. So I don't know if you are. I mean, you might have to settle some things, let go of some things, but I'm in, man. Let's go. Let's go. Let's change this whole region, man. Let's get people born again. Let's get people saved. Let's, let's, do, let's do that and then con- connect it to the faith of God. So he looks at that move and he's like, that's what I'm talking about right there. That right there is what pleases me. When my children not just move, that, but they believe I'm going to move with them. Imagine walking the angel, watching the angel of the Lord move behind that dude like walking past. you like, uh-uh. It's about to go down. I ain't never seen this dude leave his post, but, but he went all the way to the back. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's about to go on, but, but I don't want to be back there. <laughs> but let's do that. Let's do that. I have to enunciate more. I don't want Pastor G hearing this and be like, let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, I praise you for your sons and your daughters. And I thank you for this this season, and I I thank you for this next season. I thank you for the beginning of this season. I thank you for your faithfulness. And I just pray for our faith to be increased so that we put your faithfulness on display. So when we go, we understand you go with us, that we not only know you, but we know that you, will, you reward those who earnestly seek you. Let us seek you with an earnest heart. With an earnest heart, let us seek you. Father, uh, I thank you that you are always with us. Strengthen us to always be with you. You know, if you're in this room and you haven't given your life to Jesus, that's where it starts. If you're watching online, that's where it starts, is, is we, we have to trust the propitiation for our sins, trust the one who has connected us to life. So if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've just been trying and trying and ain't nothing working, at least have some hope while seemingly nothing is working so that your hope can be connected to the reality that he works, he causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him called according to his purpose in Christ. Lord, just wash yesterday away. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you're ready for a fresh start, for him to wash away yesterday, Wash away all of the wrongdoings, all of the things that we've done to miss his mark. If you want a relationship with the living God, just with every head bowed, just look up at me. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to. And if you're watching online, all you have to do, Father, I accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Wash me in your blood. Write my name in your book of life so that I can be with you forever. If you're in this place and you kind of want that new start, like maybe you walk with Jesus, but you walked away trying to do things your own. This is your time, man. Rededicate. Because the Red Sea is parting, and he has a land of milk and honey for all of us. And we can't obtain it on our own. So you just say, Jesus, I'm just coming back. I'm coming back. Coming back. I'm yours. I'm yours. You're mine. I'm doing it again. I may have walked away, but you know what? I thank you that you are the God of second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth chances. I thank you that your mercies are new every day. I get to come back to you and I give you my life. Father, I praise you for your word. I thank you for the examples of amazing men and women who were all in for you. Esther. Paul the Apostle, Moses, men and women who have just just had faith. Trigger that in us tonight. Strengthen it in us tonight. 
We thank you for all you're doing, all you've done, and all you will do. So we give you praise and honor and glory because you're worthy of it. In Jesus' name, all his people said, amen and amen.